Glenn Beck. The Blaze Radio Network. Most Americans probably consider acts of radical Islamic terrorism a relatively recent problem. They aren't. Americans first suffered at the hands of Islamists in 1785. They were kidnapped and ransomed or sold into slavery. Goods were stolen from the merchant ships and the ships confiscated repeatedly. Prior to gaining its independence, America was under the protection of the British Navy in the region and didn't have to deal with the attacks. But in 1785, Britain let it be known that the Americans were no longer their concern. Thus, America has been dealing with Islamists since its founding. In fact, the first foreign war the United States became entangled in was with Islamic extremists, the Barbary Pirates. These were Islamists who came from the Barbary Coast, Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, and Libya. The Continental Congress in the U.S. couldn't understand why their ships and citizens were attacked so often and so brutally by people they didn't even know, nor had any contact with. The problem became so severe that Thomas Jefferson sailed for London to meet with the ambassador from Tripoli. He set up an official visit with him and asked him point blank why these Barbary pirates were making warfare on a people who had done nothing to provoke them. Thomas Jefferson wrote this. The ambassador answered us that it was founded on the laws of their prophet, that it was written in their Quran, that all nations who should not have acknowledged their authority were sinners that it was their right and duty to make war upon them wherever they could be found, and to make slaves of all they could take as prisoners, and that every Muslim who was slain in battle was sure to go to paradise. Sound familiar? Radical Islamists were saying virtually the same thing 230 years ago that they're saying today. Nothing has changed. One obvious problem for America in 1785 was there was no American Navy yet to protect their interest at sea. So American administrations lapsed into a policy of appeasement for many years. They bribed the pirates. The United States of America paid a tribute to the Pasha of Tripoli that amounted to 20% of the nation's GDP, the equivalent of $760 billion today every single year. In 1796, George Washington wrote about his frustration over the pirates and France's refusal to help. Sir, your letter of the 5th instant with its enclosure came to hand by Friday's post. The extracts therein produced both pleasure and pain. The former, at hearing that our citizens are at length released from their unfortunate confinement in Algiers. The latter, to find that others of them have fallen into a similar situation in Tunis. Contrary to the truce and to the arrangement with Mr. Donaldson, tis difficult to understand precisely what the French government design relative to this country from the accounts given by Mr. Monroe. The French and the British were paying the tribute to allow the passage of their ships through the Mediterranean. It was advantageous for them to allow the attacks on American ships since those ships were in direct competition with the French and the British merchant ships. By 1794, the United States began building a navy for the purpose of finally ending the threat from the Islamist Barbary pirates. And in 1801, President Thomas Jefferson had enough. He had grown weary of nearly bankrupting the nation with the ridiculous exorbitant tribute. He stopped paying the tribute, and the Pasha of Tripoli declared war on the United States. America's first foreign war had begun. Jefferson, with the authorization of Congress, sent the newly manufactured American warships and Marines to the Barbary Coast. Blockades and battles followed. The American Navy won virtually every battle. However, in October 1803, the USS Philadelphia ran aground on a reef patrolling the Tripoli Harbor to be captured by the Islamists. They then renamed it the Gift of Allah and used it again as a gun battery against the American fleet. On the night of February 16, 1804, Lieutenant Stephen Decatur and a small group of Marines took off in a captured Tripolian vessel. 
tricking the sailors aboard the captured American ship, allowing them to get close enough. Then they stormed the ship, overpowered the Tripoli sailors, and blew up the ship. Even famed British Admiral Horatio Nelson reportedly called this the most bold and daring act of the age. By 1805, the U.S. Navy had won the war and subdued the pirates into signing a treaty to end all tribute paid to the pirates and end all violence against U.S. ships sailing the Mediterranean. Jefferson's envoy from the State Department, Tobias Lear, despite the overwhelming American victories, including taking the port city of Dern, squandered those gains by agreeing to a $60,000 ransom payment for captured Americans. The peace only lasted two years. Radical Islamists from Algiers began attacking U.S. ships again in 1807, shortly after the American naval withdrawal from the area. Meanwhile, tensions and disputes had heated up again for the U.S. with Britain and, to a lesser extent, France. With American independence literally on the line again, America was unable to deal with the threat from the Islamists. War broke out in the United States as Britain attacked. And the War of 1812 forced Americans to put everything they had into fighting for their freedom against the world's superpower a second time. Once the Second War with Britain was won, President James Madison turned his attention to the Barbary Pirates to put an end to the attacks in the Mediterranean once and for all. After the War of 1812, the U.S. Navy was now much larger. And in 1815, Madison sent an entire squadron to Algiers, led now by Commodore Stephen Decatur, veteran of the First Barbary War. The war lasted into part of 1816, but again, American forces routed the Islamists and forced the Algiers ruler, Day Omar, to reluctantly sign another treaty. This one spelling out that there would be no further tributes, no further ransoms. He also secured the release of all European prisoners from the pirates. Decatur then sailed to Tunis and Tripoli and demanded that they sign the same agreement. They did. In the meantime, De Omar decided to go back on the treaty and resume his attacks on American ships. So the U.S. sent another squadron to Algiers. And after the bombardment of the city, De Omar signed a new but virtually identical treaty. This time, the attacks on American vessels by the Barbary pirates stopped. But Algiers would again begin attacking other ships in the region, all the way until the French invasion of Algiers in 1830. That finally ended the piracy for good. Even America's founders, Washington, Jefferson, Madison, had to deal with Islamic extremists. Even they had a hard time understanding what they were up against and how to deal with it. They also learned that when the interests of nations, in their case, nations like Britain and France, don't align with their own, that the terrorist activity is not only not dealt with, it's actually encouraged. On the next episode, we show you some examples of the kind of terrorism that arises when it doesn't seem to be in anyone's interest to stop it. Glenn Beck. This is the Glenn Beck program. When Americans think of terrorists, they nearly always think of Al Qaeda or ISIS. But there is a group of bloodthirsty terrorists headquartered in Nigeria that have killed far more than either of those organizations Boko Haram. Its name means Western education is forbidden. More Christians have been killed by Boko Haram in northern Nigeria than the rest of the world combined. Yet no one seems to care about Boko Haram. Is it because it commits its heinous acts in Africa, where there's very little strategic importance to the major powers of the world? Boko Haram was founded in 2002 by its leader, Mohammed Youssef, to overthrow the Nigerian government and usher in an Islamic state. The group has frequently used bombings, assassinations, and kidnappings, and their female victims have been sold into sex slavery to further its goals. In 2009, Boko Haram carried out a series of attacks on police stations and other government buildings. 
This led to shootouts in the streets. Hundreds of Boko Haram supporters were killed and thousands of residents fled the city. Nigeria's security forces eventually seized the group's headquarters, capturing its fighters and killing their leader, Mohamed Youssef. His body was shown on state television and the security forces declared Boko Haram finished. But they weren't. Instead, they simply regrouped under a new leader, Abu Bakar Shukau, and stepped up their insurgency. In tactics and results, the menace from Boko Haram has actually become worse. Lately, they have used so many children as suicide bombers, often drugging them, then sending them out against their will to act as explosives, that now one in five suicide attacks are done by children. Residents in certain regions of Nigeria have now become suspicious of children that approach. The problem is so intense in Nigeria that Boko Haram attacks and the fear that they have created have kept more than 670,000 children out of the classrooms for more than a year. And according to UNICEF, 1.3 million children have been forced from their homes across four separate countries, Cameroon, Chad, Niger, and Nigeria. In 2014, Boko terrorists raided a school in the town of Chibok and kidnapped 200 girls at once. Abu Bakar's statement about the abduction was read by CNN's Ashley Banfield. I abducted your girls. There is a market for selling humans. Allah says I should sell. He commands me to sell. I will sell women. I sell women. His words made even more disturbing by his tone. He was laughing at times throughout the statement. Shortly after, the U.S. First Lady Michelle Obama spoke about this heinous act. Like millions of people across the globe, my husband and I are outraged and heartbroken over the kidnapping of more than 200 Nigerian girls from their school dormitory in the middle of the night. Boko Haram believed that the girls had offended Allah by first being Christian and second by having the nerve to go to school. Therefore, they reasoned Allah would want them to be enslaved. Hillary Clinton, after leaving her position of Secretary of State, had this to say about the abduction. The seizure of these young women uh, by this uh, radical extremist group, Boko Haram, is abominable, it's criminal, uh, it's an act of terrorism, uh, and it really merits uh, the fullest response possible. To make matters worse, Nigeria's president, Goodluck Jonathan, spent 18 days claiming the kidnapping was just a rumor, designed to stop him from being reelected. Boko Haram has been known to use chainsaws to decapitate their victims. They indiscriminately kill women and children, both Christian and Muslim alike. One Nigerian soldier who was interviewed by Vice explained why he fights against them and how he feels about the terrorist organization. We need to come here so that we can settle the peace because the innocent have been dying. They've been killing the innocent. So people have run away from their homes, make them homeless. Those that are in school, they make them run away from school. The business, no business no anymore. You feel good about going after Boko Haram? Yeah, I want to fight for my country. And if I die for my country, I know I die for my country. When the Boko Haram started, they were like, burning churches so people thought they were muslims who are these people they fight the christian they fight the muslim so nobody knew about them we believe they are just they are devils they don't have heart so they are not christian to me they are not muslim in january 2015 they burned 16 villages to the ground leaving piles of bodies so deep that survivors couldn't count them all also, January 2015, Boko Haram attacked the Nigerian town of Baga, killing up to an estimated 2,000 civilians, making it one of the largest terrorist atrocities in world history, perhaps second only to 9-11 in the United States. Later that year, Nigerian President Goodluck Jonathan's luck seemed to sour when he lost the election to Mohamedou Buhari, 
who vowed to wipe out Boko Haram within the first nine months of taking office. An Al Jazeera reporter, Martine Dennis, recently asked Buhari about the Nigerian security situation. Now, security is such a big problem, isn't it? You spoke to me almost exactly a year ago when you were a presidential candidate. You then promised to Nigeria that you would defeat Boko Haram by the end of 2015. Clearly, you haven't. You failed. I haven't failed. I haven't failed. I haven't failed. Just as the Mujahideen in Afghanistan morphed into Al-Qaeda and went from an uneasy ally of the West to a very dangerous and lethal enemy, neglect of this situation in Nigeria with Boko Haram could also turn deadly serious for the United States and others. Boko Haram's leader, Abubakar Shukau. We have killed countless soldiers and we are going to kill more. Our strength and firepower is bigger than that of Nigeria. Nigeria is no longer a big deal to us, as far as we are concerned. We will now comfortably confront the United States of America. Just who is this man? Threatening the United States of America, abducting little girls, selling them as sex slaves, using children as suicide bombers, indiscriminately killing thousands of Christians and Muslims, and murdering fellow human beings with chainsaws. The BBC wanted to know, and in 2014, shortly after the abduction of the 200 schoolgirls. This is Abu Bakar Shikau, the leader of the feared Boko Haram militant group. Little is known about the man whose gunman abducted 200 schoolgirls from the town of Chibok in the northeast of Nigeria. Filming openly in the region is dangerous, so the BBC has travelled covertly into the north of the country and has gained exclusive access to people who knew him well. Interviews have been done anonymously, as people are too scared of reprisals. This man was a member of what became Boko Haram. He knew Shikau personally. He's a fanatic, not well versed in Islamic law. He takes hasty decisions and is very hard line on Islamic matters. And even his former mentor was careful around him because he was not open to any form of compromise. Shikau spent his formative years here in Maiduguri, a major city in the northeast of Nigeria. Even by local standards, Shikau lived in abject poverty in this house in a slum quarter of the city. Shikau later enrolled himself at this formal Islamic school run by the government. One former classmate remembers him as a loner who kept himself apart from the other students. We thought of him as psychologically affected. Just looking at him, you could tell that he was not completely with it. But Shikau went on to lead Boko Haram five years ago, instigating a wave of terror through bombings and abductions. I headed north to meet another former colleague of Abu Bakar Shikau. He thinks the international outcry over the abductions of the 200 schoolgirls will have played well with the leader of Boko Haram. He will have been pleased with all the media attention. He's happy with what they've done. He said that they will sell the girls on as slaves and has made it abundantly clear that they will abduct more girls. Isolated as Boko Haram is, and led by a man described as unhinged as Shikau, they are continuing to wreak havoc in Nigeria. But we might be tempted to believe that they are just disconnected from the groups who've demonstrated the ability to raise money and reach into other regions of the world. Is there a Boko Haram Africa connection to Middle East extremists? Absolutely. Uh, Boko Haram is an official affiliate of ISIS. So they declared bayat, uh, allegiance to ISIS uh, earlier this year. And they now, if you ever have the misfortune of seeing one of their propaganda videos, you'll see that they refer to themselves as the Islamic State in West Africa. They've gotten a little slicker in their propaganda, particularly the videos. Um, so they are an official affiliate and consider themselves a part of the Islamic State. It is time for the United States of America and its citizens to step up its efforts to eliminate bloodthirsty terrorists like Boko Haram, given that they are now joined with ISIS. And they're not the only rising threat to be concerned about. We pick it up there in the next episode. 
Glenn Beck. The Blaze Radio Network. In earlier episodes, we told you about radical Islamic terrorism's long history in Africa. America's first foreign war was with the Islamists known as the Barbary Pirates, mostly from Tripoli and Algiers. Then we carried the discussion forward to Nigeria's ultra-deadly and despicable Boko Haram group. Terrorists who have killed thousands, sold thousands more into sex slavery, and who are so cowardly they use little girls as suicide bombers. In this chapter, we explore another radical African terrorist cell with ties to Al-Qaeda in the Middle East and possibly Boko Haram in Nigeria. The group is Somalian-based, called Al-Shabaab. Al-Shabaab practices radical Salafi, Jihadism, and Wahhabism. They believe in a very violent Islamic militancy and boast a troop strength of between seven and 9,000 militants. In 2006, Al-Shabaab gained control over Somalia's capital city, Mogadishu. That raised fear in Ethiopia that the group's violence would spill over into their country. So in December of 2006, the Ethiopian military launched an offensive into Mogadishu and successfully drove Al-Shabaab out of the city. Ethiopia's actions inflamed the group. And Al-Shabaab then attacked Ethiopia's forces in central and southern Somalia, taking control of those areas. Al-Shabaab's goal was to topple the Somalian government and replace it with Islamic rule and Sharia law. One of Shabaab's most infamous attacks took place in 2013 in Nairobi, Kenya's most upscale mall, which was owned at the time by Israelis. A group of Al-Shabaab terrorists stormed in and began shooting those shopping on that Saturday afternoon. The terrorists would pause at times to ask their victims whether they were Muslim. If the response was no, they were shot. Kenyan police responded with a huge force. Then, later that day, the military. And the fighting lasted 48 hours. We have this breaking news overseas in the capital of Kenya. Gunshots inside a shopping mall in the Kenyan capital, Nairobi. Gunmen with heavy artillery stormed a very popular shopping mall. As gunmen opened fire on shoppers, the gunmen reportedly firing AK-47. And threw a grenade at the entrance, and then they started shooting indiscriminately. An Arabic reporter interviewed Shabab's second-in-command and asked why Al-Shabaab attacked the Kenyan mall. Kenya attacked us. We have said many times, stay away from us, leave our land, our people. Stay away from us, stop fighting us. We warned them again and again, but they ignored us. So we had to spill their blood to send a message. Their women aren't better than ours. Their sons aren't better than ours. Their children aren't better than ours. When they kill our people, we kill theirs. Are you going to continue attacking Kenya? For us, this was not a war. This was just a message. It was a message that took the lives of 67 innocent people and wounded 175 more. Al-Shabaab extremist jihad had the vocal support of neighboring Kenya's highest profile Muslim sheep. Islam, true Islam, is the Islam that is being portrayed as extremism. That is the true Islam. This man, known by his nickname, Makaburi, was Kenya's highest profile radical Muslim sheikh. I will follow Islam as per the teachings of the Prophet, period. Now, if that makes them want to kill me, they're welcome. I'm, I will be glad to die for my religion. And in April of 2014, Makaburi was gunned down at a bus stop by unknown assailants. Before he died, we spent time with Makaburi, who openly supported the Somalia-based jihadi army, Al-Shabaab. Al-Shabaab's at the Westgate Mall attack was payback for Kenyan military strikes on their home base in Somalia. A sentiment the Makaburi shared. In the Islamic Sharia, we have revenge. The Kenyan army is doing the same thing to people in Somalia. They are killing innocent civilians in Somalia. Even though Al-Shabaab attacked the Westgate Mall in the capital city of Nairobi, Kenya's anti-terror forces put the hammer down in their second largest city, Mombasa, with deadly results for both jihadis and the police. You think it's just a matter of time before the government is going to kill you? Yeah. 
Clearly, Kenya's government deals with al-Shabaab, terrorism in general, and radical extremists a little differently than most. They often kill them without trial, as they did with Makabori and another imam, Sheikh Abud Rogo Muhammad, who, from his mosque in the city of Mombasa, preached that violence was the only way to reach their desired Islamic goal of Sharia law in Kenya. Rogo was arrested, then released by the courts. What took place after his release is discussed in this interview from one of the sharpshooters from the Kenyan counter-terror unit responsible for eliminating threats, such as the one posed by Rogo, when he said he's a sharpshooter and sharpshooters never arrest. We don't arrest. We never. In Red Company, we are sharpshooters. And why should a sharpshooter be taken to arrest? So the orders are very clear then? Yeah. To eliminate? Red Kamban is a sharpshooter, and the sharpshooter is always on target. According to the officers we spoke to, the order to assassinate Muslim clerics comes from a powerful body at the heart of the Kenyan government, the National Security Council. Strangely, al-Shabaab's radical brand of Islamic extremism has proven appealing to a certain group of Americans. Fox News has learned around 40 Americans and Somali Americans are claimed to be in East Africa right now, serving for the U.S. designated Islamist terror group Al Shabaab. This is more than 10 times higher than the figure previously given. David Ibsen of the Counter Extremism Project says the high profile atrocities Al Shabaab is known for, such as the attack on Kenya's Westgate Mall, in which over 60 died, and the group's strict Islamic fundamentalist lifestyle, are what is attracting so many Americans to join them. Al-Shabaab recently used a spokesman for one of their propaganda videos who sounded suspiciously American. And at the end of his rhetoric, to accentuate his point, he used a clip of Donald Trump. Yesterday, America was a land of slavery, segregation, lynching, and Ku Klux Klan. And tomorrow, it will be a land of religious discrimination and concentration camps. Okay, so remember this. So listen. Donald J. Trump is calling for a total and complete shutdown of Muslims entering the United States until our country's representatives can figure out what is going on. Another one of these radicalized Americans, this one not from Michigan, but instead from the Deep South, Daphne, Alabama, was Omar Hamami. Hamami was raised Southern Baptist by an Irish-American Baptist mother and a Syrian Muslim father. And unlike what is typically heard in cases like this, was not shunned by his classmates. He was not a loner. He was elected president of his sophomore class in high school. He was bright and considered a leader among his classmates. And he even dated one of the more popular girls in school. However, after his father rediscovered his Islamic roots, Omar converted to Islam as a teenager and by his early 20s had become radicalized. Several years ago, he suddenly uprooted his life, moved to Somalia to join al-Shabaab's terror organization, where he rose quickly through the ranks to the inner leadership circle. Along the way, he recorded this. Mortar by mortar, shell by shell, only gonna stop when I send them to hell. They lifted Somalia's stupid far on ban, after the warlords were ruined and ran. Now in their place, have a sheet all stand, from the east to the west, the heads gon' span. Word by word. Shockingly, no Grammy nominations resulted from his efforts. Hamami eventually fell out of favor with Shabab's leadership who were offended by his attempts to gain fame and by the fact that his kind of music was forbidden by their brand of Islam. Finally, after several false alarms, Hamami, who now went by the name Abu Mansur al-Amariki, or the American, was in fact ambushed and killed by al-Shabaab fighters. Still, many other Americans remain with the group in Somalia and Kenya. American President Barack Obama has recognized the need to neutralize al-Shabaab. What we discussed was the importance of, number one, continuing the effort to root out al-Shabaab's
capacity inside of, uh, inside of Somalia, working jointly. And as we speak, Kenya is working with Ethiopia and with the United States and others uh, to further degrade uh, al-Shabaab's space of operations inside of Somalia. So we have to keep that pressure going, even as we're strengthening the Somalian government, because part of the reason that al-Shabaab was able to uh, emerge as a significant threat to the region was a non-functioning gov government, of effectively a failed state in Somalia for so long. Hopefully, each of the world leaders involved in this fight will commit to aggressively doing what it takes to resolve and eliminate this serious threat. In the next episode, we take a look at what happens when the world doesn't take that threat seriously. Glenn Beck. As we have outlined, there are many vicious, bloodthirsty terrorist organizations operating today in the Middle East and Africa. But now, a decade and a half or so into the 21st century, even the dreaded Al-Qaeda, which killed 3,000 Americans on 9-11, has been somewhat supplanted in the minds of those in the West by a group called ISIS, the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria, or ISIL, the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant. The Levant, to them, also includes Israel. They are by far the most well-funded terror group in the history of mankind. Their revenue is between 2 and $3 billion a year. That would put ISIS ahead of the GDP of 31 nations on Earth. No one had ever heard the name ISIS or ISIL before 2011. That's how quickly all of this developed. ISIS began its rise in 2011 as American troops were leaving Iraq. For U.S. soldiers, the war in Iraq has come to an end. It's of Iraqis. The country was still extremely volatile. The last U.S. soldier is out of Iraq. Other than those who but Iraq's leaders said they were ready to go it alone. They weren't. Still, President Barack Obama celebrated the withdrawal and touted the now standalone Iraqi government. What we have now achieved is an Iraq that is self-governing, that is inclusive, and that has enormous potential. Part of the problem from the very beginning was that al-Maliki's government was anything but inclusive. Our senior advisor to the U.S. Embassy in Baghdad from 2003 to 2009 disagreed with Obama. President Obama gives a very rosy picture of where things are. What do you think? As somebody who voted for President Obama, I was deeply disappointed because I knew those words were going to go back and haunt him. The very day of the announcement with al-Maliki, the leader of Iraq got a message from his people in Baghdad that some of his vice president's Sunni bodyguards might be planning some sort of uprising. Al-Maliki discussed it with President Obama, who told him that all countries have their own internal affairs to deal with. Al-Maliki took that as a green light to rid himself of his enemies without U.S. intervention. He immediately set out to do that, arresting the 16 vice presidential bodyguards the next day. The attacks on Sunnis only escalated from that time on. After Maliki had Iraqi forces raid the home of a very vocal opponent to the Maliki regime, they killed his brother and arrested a radical Sunni member of parliament who hasn't been seen since. Soon, the Sunni population in Iraq had had enough. Massive Sunni protests began to spring up. Although al-Qaeda had indeed been crushed by the U.S. military, the few that did survive were the most radical, hardcore, and battle-tested of them all. They banded together with the surviving members of Saddam Hussein's Ba'ath Party. And together, they began to recruit and attack Shia Muslims and Christians by the score. The new Islamic State leader, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, took some of these hardened terrorists and sent them to Syria to recruit and fire up the Sunni population there. It worked. After organizing into the Islamic State, one of their biggest operations in the beginning was to free 500 prisoners from Abu Ghraib near Baghdad. It shocked the Iraqis and the world. 
that this new terror entity could pull off such an operation. Al-Baghdadi was not content with simply attacking targets and killing people. His vision was much larger. Al-Baghdadi declared a caliphate, meaning that this group would attack and hold on to territory. It also meant that they would not recognize borders, that as far as they were concerned, all of the territory in the Middle East was now part of this new Islamic State. Baghdadi knew that such a declaration also bound the Muslim Salafis, a radical jihadist sect, to join their cause as it was part of their religious doctrine to do so. Bolstered by the new recruits, the Islamic State attacked Ramadi and Fallujah. The fighting lasted only a few days. In the end, the Iraqi army was no match. In early 2014, Kurdish intelligence got word to al-Maliki that ISIL was planning to overrun Iraq's second largest city, Mosul. The warning also made it to the ears of U.S. President Barack Obama. But little to nothing was done. Perhaps the leaders believed the city was secure with 30,000 Iraqi troops there to protect it. In fact, in January 2014, in an interview with The New Yorker magazine, Obama referred to ISIL as a JV team. President Obama speaking out about America's deadliest enemies. His choice of words getting a lot of attention. In an interview with The New Yorker magazine, he compares groups linked to al-Qaeda to an amateur basketball team. Quote, the analogy we use around here sometimes, and I think is accurate, is if a JV team, meaning junior varsity team, puts on Lakers uniforms, that doesn't make them Kobe Bryant, end quote. However, in June of 2014, that same JV team sent just 1,500 fighters to Mosul. And after two massive suicide car bomb explosions, most of those 30,000 in the Iraqi army had run for the desert or blended in with the community. Among those who stayed to fight, some were burned to death, hanged, or crucified during the siege. The Islamic State had taken a city of 1.8 million people, and the Iraqi army was showing that they had no stomach for the fight to defend their own country. Once Mosul was taken, al-Baghdadi brazenly preached a sermon from the town's main mosque in broad daylight. Baghdadi gave a sermon in Mosul. Bin Laden never did that. Zawahiri never did that. Their victory in Mosul yielded a huge payoff. American military equipment the Iraqis had abandoned and left behind. The M1A1 tanks, heavy armored vehicles, and much more. The Islamic State then took several more on the southward march toward Baghdad, including Tikrit, Saddam Hussein's hometown. But their reign of terror didn't stop with military moves. In northern Iraq, when they'd overrun the towns and villages, they offered the Christians there three choices. Convert to Islam, pay a tax amounting to all of their yearly income, or be murdered. They found new ways to execute those who opposed them through drowning, burning, or just taking them to the beach and putting a bullet in the back of their head. They were also very technologically savvy, releasing high production value videos of their heinous crimes. As we mentioned before, this set them apart from even the Nazi regime, who tried desperately to hide their crimes. As we mentioned before, ISIL is incredibly well-funded. They have carved out an area larger than Great Britain, which they control. The vast majority of the 2 to $3 billion in incoming revenue is all from oil wells that they've seized in Iraq and Syria and now control. They then sell the oil on the black market. Knowing this, why didn't President Barack Obama direct the United States forces to attack those oil wells? Former CIA director Michael Morell explains. And we didn't go after oil wells, actually hitting oil wells that ISIS controls because we didn't want to do environmental damage and we didn't want to destroy that infrastructure. And that seemed to sum up the American administration's priorities in the battle against terrorism. Men and women are being burned alive, drowned, executed, crucified in the name of radical extremist ideology. But the environment apparently took precedence. Glenn Beck.